Hi, I'm Steve Curry, President of Radial Engines Limited, and I'd like to welcome you to this, the third in our series of Radial Engine Maintenance videos. In the first installment, we looked at the Jacobs R755 and R915 series of engines. In the second, we looked at the Continental W670s. Today, I'd do it, like to do an in-depth look at the Lycoming R680. However, before we do that, I'd like to take a, a few minutes and talk about the manufacturer's maintenance manuals. Like so many other engine manufacturers of that era, Lycoming divided up their data into several publications. We have the R680 overhaul manual. We have the uh, parts catalog. We have an operator's manual. And then we have the service bulletins. Now these service letters were never actually published in bound form, but were issued over time as the need arose and then were mailed out to the Lycoming engine owners. Uh, several years ago, we gathered as many of these R680 service letters as we could find, bound them together to make it easier for all of us to uh, locate them. But collectively, uh, these publications, along with the type certificate data sheet, are the final authority on maintaining the Lycoming R680 engines. Well, a logical question might be, if we have all this data in print, uh, why do we need a maintenance video? Uh, the answer can be found in the era in which we live. In the 1930s and 1940s, uh, when these publications were being written, radial engines ruled supreme. Aviation technical schools taught radial engine maintenance and overhaul. On any given airport, um, 85 to 90 percent of the aircraft there would have been radial powered. When a group of pilots or mechanics got together to discuss engine operation or maintenance issues, they were most likely discussing radials. Uh, today, all that's changed. Many airports don't even have one radial powered aircraft on the field. And reading through these manuals, you'll get the, uh, the picture pretty quickly that the writers of these manuals assumed that there was a body of knowledge, of general knowledge, um, about radial engines in the people maintaining these things. I mean, everybody knows that if you need uh, to grease your rocker arms on your manually greased rocker arm engine, that you use uh, Texaco Marfax number two but you won't find that in any of these publications. And um, uh, nowhere it is, is it written that if you uh, pull your engine backwards to clear a liquid lock, that oftentimes it will clear it back into the intake pipes where it will wait for the engine to start and then uh, bend a link rod and uh, move things on towards a catastrophic failure. Um, so that, that body of knowledge that used to be there for the most part has disappeared. Well, part of our hope in doing these videos is to restore some of that knowledge, uh, to flesh out the data that's uh, in these publications. Uh, our desire is not to contradict anything here, uh, so if there is a question, always go with this data. All right, a little bit about the company. Uh, Demarest Manufacturing Company, the firm that would eventually become Lycoming Engines, was founded in New York City in 1845. Their first product was a $19.50 sewing machine. In 1883, the company moved to a new manufacturing facility in Williamsport, Lycoming County, Pennsylvania. Adding bicycles to their product line in 1891, Demarest capitalized on the bicycle craze that was sweeping the nation. A year later, in 1892, two brothers from Dayton, Ohio, also entered the bicycle manufacturing market, but it would be another arena where they won their fame and fortune. By 1907, motor cars were coming into their own, and manufacturers needed engines for their horseless carriages, so it was natural for this to become a new direction for the company. The sewing machine business had become unprofitable, so that part of the business was sold off, and the company was restructured as the Lycoming Foundry and Machine Company. Until the mid-1920s, most Lycoming engine production was limited to four-cycle engines, which were used in various automobiles and boats. 
These were simple, low horsepower engines, but gave the company design and manufacturing experience that it would soon use in a much greater way. In 1927, E.L. Cord, who manufactured, among other things, the Auburn, Cord, and Duesenbergs, purchased the company, and Lake Combing became the primary supplier of engines for all those cars. Probably the best of their auto engines, the supercharged dual overhead cam straight eight produced eight times more horsepower than its contemporary, the Ford Model A. This engine was used in the legendary Duesenberg SJ, a highly prized car even in 1935, and one driven by such Hollywood luminaries as Clark Gable and Gary Cooper. In 1929, Cord added another to his collection of over 150 businesses when he struck a deal with Eddie Stinson and purchased 60% of the stock in the fledgling Stinson Aircraft Company. Cord was very interested in Lycoming's early efforts to produce a radial aircraft engine and now found himself not only an aircraft manufacturer, but also with the capability to produce his own radial engines. The first radial that Lycoming produced was not the familiar R680, but a 185 horsepower R645. Though this engine was issued type certificate number 27, it was primarily a proof of concept engine and was not produced in great quantity. The first commercially successful Lycoming radial was the R680, which was an, an enlarged R645 and was issued type certificate number 42 on February the 4th, 1930. This was a manually greased engine of 215 horsepower and sported a front exhaust collector, a feature that would carry over into the World War II era. From the rear, the engine displayed an unusual dual magneto driven by a single shaft with distributors on each side of the engine to deliver spark to the spark plugs. The early R680 also had an exposed valve train, so although finding a stuck valve was relatively easy, flying behind it was a greasy mess. At first, Stinson was the primary customer for Lycoming engines. Though the pre-EL Cord Stinson engines had been mostly Wrights, now the majority of Stinsons were Lycoming powered. From the Stinson Junior, which sported three or four seats and cruised at 115 miles an hour, to the mighty Stinson SM6000B trimotor, which carried 10 passengers in relative comfort, Cord found buyers for both his engines and his aircraft. It was the military, though, that put Lycoming aircraft engines on the map. In November of 1933, Lloyd Stearman put a fresh 215 horsepower R680-3 on his newly designed Model 70. Though the clouds of war were only just building on the horizon, it would be World War II and the contracts for tens of thousands of Lycoming R680s that gave us the more familiar 225 and 300 horse R680s that we enjoy today. By 1940, Boeing had purchased the design rights to the Stearman Model 75 and was in high gear producing the aircraft. Ultimately, over 10,000 of these Boeing Stearman cadets were manufactured. Curtis followed suit with its Lycoming-powered AT-9 fledgling, or Jeep. This high-performance advanced trader was designed to transition Army Air Corps cadets into the P-38 Lightning, but the AT-9 was a difficult aircraft to master, and the instructors who flew them decided that a cadet would need to become proficient at flying the Lightning so he would be able to fly the AT-9. Walter Beach put into production his mostly wooden Lycoming-powered AT-10 Wichita, Toward the end of the war, Beach installed a V-tail on the AT-10, a feature they would soon use with great success in their post-war bonanza. Stinson produced about 2,000 of their gull-wing V-77s as advanced trainers and utility aircraft, some of which went to the Royal Air Force. Even Spartan Aircraft Company got in on the action by installing a 225 Lycoming on their NP-1 trainer, an unsuccessful competitor to the Stearman. All in all, some 35,000 R680 engines were built by the end of the war. Many of the aircraft were mothballed and then later sold through the War Assets Administration. By the time it was over, some 37,400 American World War II aircraft were sold for flying purposes and another 26,900 were scrapped. However, even with those aircraft that were scrapped, the engines were often saved and then sold as spares. Had it not been for the massive quantities of engines and spare parts built during that conflict, the antique aircraft hobby would be very different today. 
We have in our warehouse hundreds of crates still unopened since 1943 containing new radial aircraft engine parts. Now let's go out into the shop and we'll take a look at some engines. We're out here in final assembly and we have a, um, an R680-E3B 300 horsepower engine on our test truck. Uh, we just ran this yesterday to, uh, to break it in, put seven, hour and seven hours and 20 minutes on it. And so it's ready now to um, take off the truck detail and deliver to the customer. It'll be going on a Stinson V77. But um, I, I want to come back to the, um, the operator's manual and talk about uh, engine differences, model differences. If you, if you look at the operator's manual, you'll see that, um, that there are several different models, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven models that are described here. Um, anywhere from uh, the, the original R680, which was 215 horsepower, to uh, the R680B2, which was 240 horsepower. The R680B4 was 225 horsepower. Uh, the B5 was 260 horsepower. And then we have a 245, a 260, a 245, a 290, a 280, the 300, the 220, and the 210. The 220 and the 210 were seven cylinder Lycoming engines, uh, which are very, very rare. You probably won't see any of those. In addition to the engines that are listed here, Lycoming also did a supercharged engine, the R680-10, which was 320 horsepower. But you probably won't see any of those either. I think there were only a handful made. Of all these models, 99% of what you're going to see are going to be engines like this one, the 300 horsepower or the 225 horsepower. The reason is because all these engines were built for the military during World War II. The, um, uh, the AT-10, the AT-9, the V-77 um, all used this engine. And then the Stearmans used the, uh, the 225 horse. And um, coming back to the type certificate data sheet, I just want to say something about these manuals again. If you don't have these manuals and you're trying to operate and maintain these engines, it's going to be really tough. We've got copies of these things. Get copies of them. They're not expensive, and uh, they're just a wealth of information. And so, uh, so you need these if you're trying to maintain these engines. If we go to the, the TC data sheets, for these two engines, for the, um, uh, the 300 horse and the 225 horse Lycomings, you'll notice that, uh, and I'm looking at uh, uh, TC data sheet uh, E202 now, which is the one for the 300 horse. There are several different models that are listed there. The R680 E1, E2, E3, E3A, and E3B. Now the E3A and the E3B were the two military versions. Or those were the, the E3A and E3B are the civilian designations for the military engines. Uh, the E3A is a military R680-9, and it, it says it right here on the TC data sheet. Um, the R680-E3B was the R680-13. We get calls all the time from people asking, what is the difference between a dash 13 and a dash 9, or an E3A and an E3B? It is strictly the material that the cases were made from. The power cases were all aluminum, but on the nose cases and the accessory cases, you would sometimes find magnesium-cased engines rather than aluminum-cased engines. That's the only difference between the Dash 9 and the Dash 13, or the E3A and the E3B are the materials that the cases were made from. Um, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the R680, um, 225 horse, you, it's a very similar thing. You have the R680B4B, B4C, B4D, B4E. It's the B4D and the B4E that you see so many of because those were the ones that were used on the Stearmans. So the B4D was either a military-8 or a military-11. The B4E was the military-17, which is what the vast majority of the, uh, of the Stearmans were powered with, the R680-17. So what were the differences between the 225 horse and the 300 horse? Um, a lot of horsepower difference. <laughs> uh, 
uh, they had the same bore, they had the same stroke, but they had a different compression ratio and they turned at different speeds. So the, uh, the R680-17, the 225 horse, uh, turned slower and it had 5.5 uh, to 1 compression ratio pistons. The R680 uh, E3A or E3B turned faster, turned 2300 RPM, and it has uh, 7 to 1 compression ratio pistons. So uh, many, many of the parts are interchangeable on these engines. Uh, the accessory drive shafts are interchangeable, the link rods are interchangeable, same piston pins. Um, it's lots and lots of interchangeable parts, but a lot of parts that aren't too. Uh, different nose cases, different accessory cases, uh, different cylinders. Now you'll, you'll notice that on this engine you'll see the, the short stacks that are sticking up back here in the back. That's because it's a rear exhaust engine. And when we run them on the test cell, we like to run short stacks because we can watch each cylinder fire. And if we have a problem, if we have a cylinder that isn't breaking in as quickly as the others, we can see it uh, puffing black smoke. Um, and so we know we have a problem there. Um, but uh, so this is a um, this is a rear exhaust engine. All the 300s were. Uh, this has very closely spaced fins on the cylinders because it is designed for a pressure cowl. So it has baffles. The 225s are spaced very widely, and they were not designed for a pressure cowl. Uh, this engine also has provision on the nose case for a prop governor, so you can run a constant speed prop on the 300 horse engines, you can't run a constant speed prop on the 225s. Let me back up. There is an STC to use a 225 horsepower engine with a constant speed prop that's been locked down, so it's really just a ground adjustable prop. So that, that isn't quite true that you can't use, you can't use a um, a constant speed prop in constant speed on a 225. You can use one that's been locked down as a uh, as a ground adjustable. But this is a is a true uh, constant speed engine. Gets oil up through the crankshaft to the nose case, and so um, uh, so this engine can uh, handle the Hamilton standard 2B20 uh, propeller. Now let's go around back side of the engine, and I'll show you a few differences on the back. All right, we're around on the back side now and um, want to point out a few things to you. Uh, we have the, the dual magneto up here um, with the high tension leads that come down to the distributors. Now one of the differences on the, uh, on the 220, between the 225 and the 300 is that the 225s almost never ever were shielded uh, from the beginning. Most of those were World War II engines for Stearmans. The Stearmans uh, weren't running radios, so it was a very, very unusual thing to find a 225 horse engine that had a shielded ignition system on it. Nearly all of the 300s had the shielded ignition systems on them. This is the uh, the World War II era shielded ignition system. We'll talk about this a little bit later and um, uh, because there are some some unique challenges that that, that system uh, gives us. The, um, the 300 horse has provision right here for a, uh, this is a fuel pump drive, so you can, you can drive a fuel pump there. Has a provision for a vacuum pump here. On most of the 225s, they did not have that because, again, they were, they were on Stearmans that, that needed neither a fuel pump nor a, um, a vacuum pump. This is the, uh, uh, the alternator or generator drive up here. Uh, other than that, those differences, uh, the engines are very, very similar uh, looking from the rear. Again, there are a lot of internal ch differences uh, in the accessory case, uh, but, uh, but externally they're, they look very similar. Here we have a, a very stock 225 Lycoming. This is an R680-17, so this most likely was a Stearman engine uh, in the beginning. It, um, it still has the unshielded ignition system on it, which is a little bit unusual these days. You, you don't see these very often. Uh, most everyone is converted to a, uh, a shielded system. But you can see the, uh, the yellow cap plugs that are covering the exhaust ports. This is a front exhaust engine. And so normally there will be a, a dish pan that bolts up here and then a, an exhaust collector. Um, you can also see the widely spaced fins 
because this is not designed for a, uh, a pressure cowling, no baffles for this one. And, uh, and then where the, the 300 horse, this casting on the nose case, it has a, a prop governor that bolts in here. This is just a plug, so there's no provision for the, the prop governor on this one. Okay, here we are on the back side of the 225. You can see the unshielded distributor cap, just a phenolic uh, cap with no uh, aluminum shield over it. The unshielded wires that run into that. In the location on the, on the 300 horse where we had the fuel pump drive, we just have a cover on the 225. And in, um, in like fashion, on the location on the 300 where we had a vacuum pump drive, we just have a cover on the uh, on the 225. It's a much uh, much less complex engine. Well, that pretty much covers the model differences uh, between the two engines that we're most likely to run across.